which company do you think, company, uh, had the most computer related innovations in the 1970s? It was in fact uh, Xerox, uh, uh, and uh, much of what we know today, and everything from the laser printer, uh, copier to the ethernet, PC printers of various kinds, uh, email, the mouse, uh, et cetera, et cetera, all were created by Xerox, the, the copier company. And the idea uh, was, this is quite appropriate that we're in a uh, media and printing uh, building here today, uh, because at the time, in the late 60s, Xerox said, you know, there's this thing that people are suggesting that is the paperless office. And the paperless office might happen soon. And if you're a copier company, well, we need to be prepared for the paperless office. And, and so they invested money in, in, a, in a, an R&D organization, research and development organization, called the Xerox Park Research Center. In fact, these were some of the outcomes from Xerox Park, of Park standing for Palo Alto Research Center. Um, and so here's one. This is, you can see it's a printer. You can see the origins of the of printer. They look a bit like a copier. Uh, that's a, a PC from the 1970s. Um, keep this image in mind, because I'll show you what a PC looked like a few years afterwards, uh, after this uh, Xerox Alto. This is what um, um, kids were doing with the, playing video games, for instance, at that time. And yet, by the 1980s, all that was history. You know, few except for some uh, curious individuals like Mario here even know about the history of Xerox in, in the PC business. And, and the question people ask is, why? What happened? What happened at Xerox? Similar story. Joe Wilson was the head of Xerox. He's the one who was the visionary. He decided to invest in the Palo Alto Research Center. Uh, they were the explorers going out and discovering new things. He died. And the new managers came in, uh, and they were uh, MBAs. They were called the Ford Boys. They were uh, some of the early MBAs, uh, and they were, um, you know, good with spreadsheets and Excel. Well, Excel didn't exist there, but you know, doing accounting. <coughs> uh, and they said, you know, what is this really given us? This new thing, the, the paperless office. Well, shoot, it still hasn't arrived, but uh, uh, they were right in some ways. Uh, and they said, you know, we have to invest in today's copiers. The Japanese are attacking us right now. Huh? We can't just be going into other areas that may never pay off. Uh, we have to invest today. And we need to reduce costs. Uh, we need to cut. Uh, we need to improve quality, very true. Uh, and we have to compete with the Japanese. We have to copy what they're doing rather than try to create new things in new industries. They, uh, they did not see the, uh, the wealth in the electronic office uh, and refused uh, to commercialize many of these uh, um, uh, innovations. I'll show you a, a brief video of, of Xerox Palo Alto Research Center. It all began in 1971 in Palo Alto, just south of San Francisco, when Xerox, the copier company, set up the Palo Alto Research Center, or PARC. Xerox management had a sinking feeling that if people started reading computer screens instead of paper, Xerox was in trouble. Unless they could dominate the paperless office of the future. You could take uh, computer technology into the office and make the office a much better place to work. More productive, uh, more enjoyable, a lot more enjoyable, um, more interesting, more rewarding. Uh, and so we set to work on it. Bob Taylor ran Park's computer science lab, and one of the first things he did was to buy bean bags for his researchers to sit on and brainstorm. These are a couple of uh, the original bean bag chairs. Uh, the role of the bean bag chair in computer science is ease of use. Okay. It was said that of the top 100 computer researchers in the world, 58 worked at Park. Strange as the staff never exceeded 50. So you didn't get your butt low but Taylor gave these nerd geniuses unlimited resources and protected them from commercial pressures. It's very comfortable. Now let's see you get out of it. I feel my, my neural capacity already increasing. There you go. Oh, God. <laughs> the atmosphere at Park was electric. Uh, there was total intellectual freedom. There was no conventional wisdom. Uh, almost every idea was up for challenge and got challenged regularly. The management said, go create the new world. We don't understand it. 
here are people who have a lot of ideas and tremendous talent, young, energetic. People came there specifically to work on five-year programs that were their dreams. This is a computer room in the basement of the Xerox Palo Alto Research Center. About 25 years ago, they built the Max time-sharing system in here, and now it's loaded with all sorts of other computers. And uh, there's one that we're really interested in here. Let's see. Here it is. Let me, let me turn on the lights. OK. Here we have it. This is a Xerox Alto computer. Uh, built around 1973. Some people would argue that this is the first personal computer. Uh, it really isn't, because for one thing, it, it wasn't ever for sale, and the parts alone cost about $10,000. But it has all the elements of a, quite a modern personal computer. And without it, we wouldn't have the Macintosh, we wouldn't have Windows, we wouldn't have most of the things we value in computing today. And ironically, none of those things has a Xerox name on it. What's the mail this morning? This promotional film made in the mid-70s to flaunt Xerox Park research shows just how revolutionary the Alto was. It was friendly and intuitive. This is an experimental office system. It's in use now. It had the first GUI using a mouse to point to information on the screen. It was linked to other PCs by a system called Ethernet, the first computer network. And what you saw on the screen was precisely what you got on your laser printer. It was way ahead of its time. Thank you, Fred. Everybody wanted to make a real difference. We really thought we were changing the world, and that at the end of this uh, project, or the set of projects, personal computing would burst on the scene exactly the way we had envisioned it, and take everybody by total surprise. But the brilliant researchers at Park could never persuade Xerox management that their vision was accurate. Head office in New York ignored the revolutionary technologies they owned 3,000 miles away. They just didn't get it. And none of the main body of the company was prepared to accept the answers. So there was a tremendous mismatch between the management and what the researchers were doing in that these guys had never fantasized about what the future of the office was going to be. And when it was presented to them, they had no mechanisms for turning those ideas into real life products. And, and that, was, that was really the frustra frustrating part of it, because you were talking to people who didn't understand the vision. And yet the vision was getting created every day within the, the Palo Alto Research Center. And there was no one to receive that vision. Um, some of the, that gentleman you saw, John Warnock, the guy with the beard, um, he left uh, Xerox Park and founded his own company, basically taking ideas that they'd created there. Uh, and the company is called Adobe. You may have heard of that. He created Adobe. He's the CEO. Um, the other guy, Larry Tesla, the guy who's wearing sort of a silk shirt, he became chief technology officer at Apple, one of the you know, early founders of Apple. Um, the, um, uh, another guy you saw founded a company called 3Com, which is one of the big networks, uh, networking companies and computers. Uh, he invented the Ethernet, really, when he was at, uh, uh, at Xerox. And uh, Adele Goldberg is still one of the top uh, computer scientists in the world. Um, she has a story that uh, uh, Xerox management didn't know what to do with these guys. Right? They were doing all this stuff, and uh, it didn't seem to have any relevance to copying. So uh, she said Xerox management told her to give a demo, a demonstration of uh, what they were doing to this young kid uh, named Steve Jobs, uh, who was interested uh, in learning about uh, what was happening at uh, Xerox Park. And they said, well, do it. And she said, no, I think this is a bad idea, because you know, these guys have, they, they might take some of our core ideas. We should be introducing them, not him. They said, no, no, do it. You know, it's not likely we're going to use it anytime soon. And she said, I want you to give it to me in writing that you're making me do this. And they said, OK, we'll go to you in writing. And so she did this demo to Steve Jobs. And he says, you know, they showed me all of these things. I could not even comprehend. My brain was like so like hurting from all of the things I saw at Xerox Park. And uh, the one thing I took away, um, I, mean, I, I didn't even process the rest. The one thing I took away was, um, was what you see is what you get. The graphical user interface, that's what it was. Graphical user interface, so uh, clicking on things and so on. And that's how the original Mac uh, was created, the Macintosh computer. So in many ways, uh, we, Apple owes its origins to 
what happened at Xerox Park. And if you think about all of the innovations that came out of Xerox Park, um, that is probably worth trillions now, and almost nothing out of that has the Xerox name on it. Right? In fact, I was on a on a TV program with the uh, last um, CEO of um, Xerox, uh, Anne Mulcahy, and and we talked about this case, and she's heard this many times, and she said, no, 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 you know, we do have one. Of all of our Xerox copiers today are not really copiers. They're scanners and printers. You know, you think of them as copiers, and, the, and that was invented at Xerox Park, so we really, it is a Xerox uh, output, but really. I mean, you know, Xerox of today is a small, pale shadow of what it could have been, right? So the opportunity, even though they may have used some parts of it, the opportunities uh, involved were huge.